Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on differential equations. This is video number 35, or video 8 in the subsection on Laplace's equation. Specifically, I'm going to solve the polar angle equation. In video 34, I solved the azimuthal equation. In video 33, I derived the Laplacian and spherical coordinates. In video 32, I, I solved the radial equation. In video 31, I moved Laplace's equation from rectangular to spherical coordinates and applied the method of separation of variables to separate the solution a function of three variables into the product of uh, three single variable functions. Each of, these single variable fu each of these single variable functions was the solution of their own differential equations and each was an ordinary differential equation. So we had to solve the azimuthal, the radial and the polar angle equation. Where we're going to next is we're going to try and calculate the wave function of the the wave functions of the hydrogen atom. In order to do that, we need to be able to solve these three differential equations. So I've written on the bottom left of your screen in black the polar angle equation. Note that we're dealing with the angle theta. So we have capital theta, a function of small theta. So we have one over sine theta, del del theta, sine theta, del del theta minus b over sine square root theta, all operating on the function capital theta is equal to minus a times capital theta. b and a, the two capitals, are the separation constants which we got from separating out uh, Laplace's equation and using the method of separation of variables. So the, the trick to solving the polar angle equation is to use a separation of, or excuse me, a change of variables, where we go from capital theta, a function of small theta, to capital P a function of small p. Now sometimes people write it capital P a function of small z, but I'm going to leave it as a function of small p. So we just need to be careful and know when we're talking about the function p a function of small p and the actual variable small p. Now we need to get the partial derivative del del theta of course in order to do this change of variables and we need to work out what sine theta is and of course sine theta del del theta. So the trick we're going to do is we're going to let p equal to cos theta. And I'm you know I'm not going to go through every step, I'm just going to leave them there for you. You can stop them as you stop the video as you please. But we can work out that dp is equal to minus the square root of 1 minus p squared the d theta. Now note by the way, we're going from we're going to be going from partial derivatives to total derivatives because this fu this function will either be a function of theta or p and it's no, it's no longer a partial differential equation, it's an ordinary differential equation. Now, let's say for example we take an arbitrary function f. So f is a function of, uh, it's a function of theta. So uh, it's a function of p we'll say, so I want to get del f del theta, I apply the chain rule. So I have del f del p and I have, or df dp, del f del p and del p del theta. Now note by the way that Del or dp d theta or del p del theta that is already performed that's there is an answer to that namely minus one outside of the square root of one minus p squared but this del f del p that is that is an operator and we're only using f there to make sure we don't make any mistakes so what we do is you bring this to the right hand side because it, it'll be an operator and we bring dp d theta to the left hand side so you can see here that we have the operator term del del p on the right hand side. It's to make sure we don't make any errors uh, with our product rules in the future. So we can rewrite del del theta as minus one outside of the square root of one minus p squared d dp. So we can also plug in for the rest of the, we'll say the, the rest of the components in the differential equation, sine theta, del del theta, and so on. Now, this is the, the operator in the differential equation, one over sine theta, del del theta, outside of sine theta, del del theta. And using the product rule for derivatives, we're very easily able to sub that or change that into the operator as a function of p. And that is it there just on the bottom left of your screen. So we're now in a position to change the differential equation from the variable of theta to the variable of p. And I've written that on the top right of your screen. So just to read it out, we've 1 minus p squared, del 2 del p squared, 
minus twice P del or DDP outside of minus B over one minus P squared, all acting on the function capital P, a function of small p, is equal to minus A times capital P, a function of small p. Now, in the previous video, we solved the azimuthal equation, and we worked out that the square root of B is equal to M. So M is an integer, and we, we I suppose we know that that's going to be the magnetic quantum number. So plugging in for the square root of B, we get we have this m squared term now. And I've just rewritten the equation in terms of m, solved it to make it a homogeneous equation, and kept a inside as an operator here like this. So this is the standard way of writing this particular equation. And the equation is called the associated Legendre equation. So I'm sure you, you, you will have heard of the Legendre equation, just like you might have heard of the Bessel's equation or whatever it is. So this is the associated Legendre equation. Now when we let m is equal to zero, we get the Legendre equation. So you can see, of course, that we will get rid of this term on the right hand side. So in solving equations, we always start with the easiest case. So I'm going to start with the case of m is equal to zero and solve the Legendre equation. So the Legendre equation has singularities or poles at p is plus or minus one. And we realize that by just basically dividing across by a one minus p squared. And we see that when, like I said, p is equal to plus or minus one, we get a divide by zero scenario, which is a singularity or a pole. So for that reason, we must use the method of power series in order to solve this particular equation. You can see videos two through to 14 for the uh, method of solving power series, or excuse me, differential equations using power series. So what we do is we make the suggestion that p a function of small p can be written as the infinite power series from n is equal to zero to infinity, of course, of the coefficients a sub n times p to the n. Now this isn't the method of Frobenius because we would have another term in the exponent if it was the method of Frobenius, but we don't require that in this particular case. So on the top right of your screen, I've written the suggested power series again. Now we know from looking at the Legendre equation that we need the first and second derivatives. So I've calculated the first and second derivatives, derivatives here, and that's very straightforward. Note, by the way, that I've left it starting at n is equal to zero each time. Now you might know that we'll say for the first derivative of a regular power series, um, you can you can change this to being n is equal to one and it's the same thing but i'm going to leave it as at n is equal to zero for a reason you'll see in a moment similarly similarly for regular power series solutions for the second derivative we can say this is n is equal to two because if you plug in n is equal to one and n is equal to zero the terms will be zero anyway and similarly for the first derivative the first n is equal to zero is just going to be equal to zero anyway but just for convenience i'm going to leave them all starting at zero now, I'm going to break the, the differential equation up into four parts, having plugged in the power series. So we have 1 minus p squared outside of the, uh, outside of the second derivative. Then we have minus 2p times the first derivative and a outside of the, uh, a outside of the zeroth derivative. And I've called the, the, the part of the equation where I multiply by 1 and the second derivative just equation 1 minus p squared by the second derivative as equation two, and three and four are pretty obvious. Now, in order for us to be able to use the power series solution method, we must have all the power series beginning at the same point, and they must all have the same exponent. Now, in this case, they are all going to begin at n is equal to zero, and have the exponent p, uh, p to the n, or the exponent n. Now, if you're familiar with the method of power series, well, you, you obviously know that that could be anything, provided that they're all the same. But if we look closely, look at number, look at equation four, we see that it already is an exponent n and it's starting at n is equal to zero. If we look at equation three, when we multiply in by this p term here, it's gonna go from p to the n minus one to p to the n. So this term is correct. If we look at, equation two where we multiply by p squared instead of having p to the n minus two 
we're just going to have p to the n, which is correct. The only term which we'll have to adjust is when we multiply in by 1, or when we don't multiply in at all, I suppose you could say. So we need to adjust that and do a small bit of shifting of indices. So I've rewritten equation 1 on the top left of your screen in black. Like I said a moment ago, notice that we are two terms away from p to the n. And I've decided to go for p to the n because three of the other equations are already at that particular, um, or have that particular form. But we don't have p to the n yet. So what we do is we start writing out the, the, the first few terms in this power series. So I have n is equal to 0, and I have n is equal to 1. Notice that both of these terms go to 0. So in this case, it's the same as writing n is equal to 2 instead of n is equal to 0. So we have n is equal to 0 is the starting at n is equal to 0 is the exact same thing as starting at n is equal to 2 because the first two terms are, are 0 anyway. So I've rewritten this particular equation as follows. So we're starting at n is equal to 2 and we have the exact same uh, power series. Now when we're shifting indices, whichever direction you shift the your power series, the actual the terms in the power series go the opposite direction. So if I went from n is equal to 2 to let's say n is equal to 4, this would be going up and the terms in the power series would be going down. But I want, if you look closely, we want n is equal to 2 to go to n is equal to 0, so that has to go down. As a result, the terms in the power series must go up, which is exactly what we want anyway. So we shift all the indices, we shift the terms in the power series up and the the indice of the power series down. And we get equation 1 rewritten as follows. And if you notice, it's got both an exponent of n and it begins at n is equal to 0. So on the top right of your screen, I've rewritten the Legendre equation and I have factored out the power series and p to the n. Notice by the equation, it has to equal 0. Now, we're going to say that p to the n is non-zero, else we have the trivial solution. So that means the sum of the coefficients must be zero. So I've rewritten the coefficients, and if you look closely here, we'll say the, these, these two sets of coefficients here can be re rewritten as n outside of n plus one. Or we have the recurrence relation written here. So a n plus two is n outside of n plus one, minus the separation constant capital A divided by n plus 2 multiplied by n plus 1. So I can leave this as an exercise for you, but if you look closely and do a bit of playing around, you realize in actual fact we have two sets of, uh, two sets of recurrence relations. We have one for when n is equal to an even number and one when n is equal to an odd number. And notice, by the way, this capital pi is multiplication, where capital sigma is addition. So, if we just plug in the ends, we get the following form for p, a function of small p. We have a0 multiplied by a certain number of coefficients, or a certain set of coefficients, and a1 multiplied by a certain set of coefficients. The coefficients are called the Legendre polynomials. So, that's really the answer but I need to show you a small bit of a sleight of hand. So if we go back up to our recurrence relation, so on the top right of your screen, I've written the recurrence relation. Now, if you look closely at the bottom, we can rewrite this as n outside of n plus three. So if we go for a large n, so we try and have a look at a lot of the terms in the power series, that means both a and the number two are small in comparison with n and can be ignored. And basically we're left with that a n plus 2 divided by a n is the same is approximately 1. So this means that the series is not converging. You would expect of course this to be getting very very small or expect it to be 0 uh, but it's not it's not it's not doing that that the power series is not converging. Now we need it to converge. In order for this to be a physical solution it has to ha has to converge. So what we do instead is we require the power series to terminate. And if you look at the recurrence relation, the power series terminates when capital A, the separation constant, is equal to n outside of n plus 1. So we call this n max. Now I'm sure you've seen, uh, you've seen numbers written like this in the past, and I'm, you know exactly where we're going. 
So a can be written as n max outside of n max plus one. Now we're solving the polar equation, so we replace n with L, because n is the orbital angular momentum quantum number. So we now have the form for the separation constant capital A, it's L outside of L plus one, and we know that capital B is equal to m squared, where m squared is the magnetic quantum number. So with this particular substitution, we're able to calculate the Legendre polynomials and off we go and that we have our solution. There is a better way, a very, a very common way of calculating the Legendre polynomials and it's by using Rodriguez formula. So I've written Rodriguez formula there just for your, uh, just for reference, I won't really be using it. Notice that it's P a function of L, it depends on L and it depends on small p of course. So where do we go from here? Well, we're, we're nearly finished. So remember that in order for us to get the Legendre equation, we set m is equal to zero in the associated Legendre equation. So we'll say we really just looked at a, simple, a simplified equation. So if you bring back m, or we say m is non-zero, we require two quantum numbers in order to get our solution for capital P, a function of small p. And Rodriguez's formula gets modified to what I have there on the left hand side of your screen. Now we're not really going to be going to going we're not really going to be going into it, other than to note the following. Up until now there has been no uh, there has been no restriction really on what L or M can be. They both can be positive or negative integers and both can be zero. But look at the Rodriguez formula. We're taking here we're taking the derivative of an, a, a polynomial of order L. So the derivative, the power of the derivative is M plus L. So if you look closely, there are, you cannot have a derivative when M is greater than L because we will be getting, we, we, it'll go to zero, it'll vanish. That put, puts a restriction on M. So M can be minus L, minus L plus one, minus L plus two, the whole way up to L. So we call the solutions p a function of small p, a function of the quantum number m, and the function a function of the quantum number l, spherical harmonics. And I'm sure you know exactly where we're going with this. These are the, the typical drawings you have of your wave functions, let's say of hydrogen or whatever it is. So I've sketched, of course, in two dimensions, because I'm drawing in a piece of paper, rather than three, some of the first few spherical harmonics. So you have you know we've that's let me this this is one that's a pretty typical spherical harmonic we've seen that plenty of times and just show you just to show you a few more of the spherical harmonics note of course that l is going to be greater than m okay so that's all i've got to say about that thanks for watching please pass it on to your friends subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below